Selena, I am so happy to have you in the po- on the podcast today. I'm pretty sure that uh, this has been a long time coming. I've been wanting to have you on my podcast for a very long time. So super welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is going to be super, like we have already been laughing and <laughs> giggling and I think people can feel that energy in a podcast and it just, if you can hear that people are having fun and it's a great conversation, you want to be part of it. And I think it is so... I think it's so powerful and we really need to respect people who listen because we are literally in their heads right now. Yeah. Like you have your earbuds in, we are in your brain. So I think making sure that we deliver value, but also a conversation that people feel like, you know, they're part of, that is really important when we, when we go live with a podcast. So thank Yeah, you. absolutely. And two podcasters, two marketing retailers talking, um, you know, this is going to be a fun one. But for my listener who perhaps hasn't come across Selena and I or just wants to know a little bit more about you, let's start there. Tell me a little bit about yourself and about your business. Start wherever you like. Oh, okay. Um, let's start like right back at the beginning Uh, We'll just kind of gloss, we'll just like condense it down so that we don't take too long, which was, uh, I had to leave home when I was 14. My mom didn't really like kids. Funnily enough, I kind of developed that. (laughs) We'll get into that. My mom didn't really like kids. So I had to leave home at 14, didn't have anywhere to go, kind of bounced around a little bit. Um, So I was kind of essentially homeless, ended up getting shipped off to my paternal grandparents. Uh, So I lived in Queensland, they were in Sydney. They weren't really ready for a teenager. And I have to say, like, I was, I reckon I was like uber cool teenager. Like I literally just sat in my room and read my books. Okay. Like I had two, two goldfish and I loved reading. I, you know, I wasn't rowdy, but they kind of weren't ready to have a teenager in the house. My grandmother was super strict. And anyway, it all broke down a few months later and I ended up at the age of like 15. So I was 14 when I left and at 15, I moved in with my teenage boyfriend's mom like you know just think about the boyfriend you had when you were 14 (laughs) oh well I have to actually say I married my 15 year old boyfriend or when I was 15 I actually married that man so my story is a little bit unique that way (laughs) but I would not have moved in with his mother sorry Pam if you're listening (laughs) (laughs) but I like I look back now and she was absolutely bonkers fruitcake like (laughs) I look back now that's not funny sorry I shouldn't laugh no no she (laughs) had a whole host of problems but and she was literally a nut job like her version of some uh, like spaghetti bolognese was literally spaghetti with tomato sauce tomato ketchup like that's what you would get just there was a whole bunch of stuff going on and I remember I used to kind of make fun of her behind her back but now as a grown-up I'm like Oh my God, like that lady took in her teenage boyfriend's you know, girlfriend, teenage <laughs> son's girlfriend. Like that's a huge commitment. And yeah. admittedly, it wasn't for a long period of time because I actually ended up st- randomly, I finished school year 12 when I was 15, 15 yeah. and nine months, long story. Um, so I ended up moving from Blacktown in Sydney, which at the time was very sort of lower socioeconomic, but just very suburban. Like no one was rich, but yeah, lots of um, housing, ex-housing commission where people had bought the houses. Um, Nothing was fancy. No one had pools or anything like that. And I moved from Blacktown to Newtown, which if anyone knows Newtown, it's like the St Kilda in Melbourne, um, like very edgy. Geeks and freaks is what it was. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And moved there with the boyfriend again, like 15 turning 16. And funnily enough, that relationship didn't last. I wonder why. (laughs) Um, Ended up moving out on my own and got a job, stayed in corporate. I was in, I worked for the government. I was a horticulturist and arborist and I worked for the government for 15 years or so. Ended up um, getting to the point where, and I didn't know it at the time, but what I was really good at was hacking systems to make things better, cheaper, faster, which is really difficult in government because nothing is better, cheaper, faster. And so looking back now, I can see how I used to hack these systems. I would just make systems up like, 
we were like Google driving things back in the day because we or emailing things and putting them in drives so that people had, didn't have to deliver pieces of paper. Anyway, fast forward all of that. I left my cushy government job and started up an eco baby business back at the beginning of the global financial crisis, number one, which was 2007. I was pregnant with my daughter, passionate about sustainability. Eco was not a thing. So I brought, I, I did a lot of importing of products, uh, a lot of manufacturing of products, grew that business to an award-winning chain of stores, which I went on to sell in 2015. And then from there, I rested on my sales laurels for a few months while the money was you know, in the bank, <laughs> got very, very bored and kind of fell into this consulting role, but not meaning to realize I have a really good knack at growing businesses. Like mm -hmm. I, I say that my superpower is being able to have a conversation and sometimes within minutes, like two minutes, I will know like instinctively where the problems are and what they need to do to get to here, <laughs> which is not, you know, a little jump, but like the end jump. And that can be really scary for mm. a lot of people because having somebody tell you that you can go, I'm just going to pull numbers out of the air. Let's just say you're doing a hundred thousand dollars and I'm saying, but you should be doing 10 million. Like the concept to someone Xing that amount quite often is unfathomable, unfathomable and they can't even see how it would be possible, but I've already seen it. I already know all the things that we could do to get you there. And so is that I think because they're already in the grind. They're already like, I don't have time to go to the toilet or I, you know, I'm not even seeing my kids now at a hundred thousand, never mind talking 10 million. Is that their thing that they're like, how on earth am I going to find time for that? I think that's part of it. Yeah. I think the other part is quite often people start a business because, and whether it's retail, e-commerce or a service-based business, because they either see a need, like a gap in the market, mm -hmm. or they have something that they're passionate about, whether it's a product or a community, and, and they just want to fill, this is especially women, they just want to fill that gap. And mm -hmm. so they don't go into it thinking, I want to build a $100 million empire. It's like, I just want to help these people. Yes. And I can do that by X. And so, like you said, they start and then the reality sets in that is, oh, can I, is this PG rated? <laughs> yeah, it is PG rated. <laughs> okay. Oh crap. <laughs> I have to make money out of this thing because it's no longer a hobby and it's taking a lot of my time and I'm not seeing my kids as much. And, you know, my husband's saying, are you still working? And I'm you know, forfeiting my weekends and I'm at soccer and I'm on my phone. And you start to realize that. So the concept of going from where you are now to, you know, 10Xing or 100Xing is like, but I can't see how it would happen without me having to work more. Mm. And so I would love it if we could talk about that because Quite often, in fact, nearly always, the answer to scaling a business, which I know we're going to talk about is kind of a dirty word, but the answer to scaling a business is not about working more. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's being comfortable. And, and look, I still struggle with this now. Like I'm literally here making work because I don't know what it's like to not work. I have worked since I was 15. Mm -hmm. And for many, many years, I worked two jobs back to back, like my full-time government job. And then I used to pack, um, pack shelves at Franklin's back in the day from four o'clock. So I finished at three, I would go from four till 11 and then back at work at seven o'clock the next morning. And so I like working for me is almost like a hobby, but I think the foundation of all of that was that concept that we get fed. And I really hate that whole hustling culture, which is the, the myth that if I work more, I'll make more money. Mm -mm. And I think that happens when we work in a job for someone else, because yeah. you do, you get paid on an hourly rate. So the more mm -hmm. you work, the more you get paid, but it doesn't work like that when it's your own business. Mm, I think that's such a great distinction, but I think most of us start off as an employee. Not many people go straight into owning their own business. So we're bringing those foundations that we learn with us into our own business. So that's such a great example to sort of stop and think it's not the same. 
Oh, I don't know if we we're going to talk about this, but if I could quickly jump in, I have um, kind of written out my version of the four roles that you take in your own business. And the first one is employee. Like you are literally doing everything. And the whole business is built on how much time, money, and energy, how many hours you put in. That's the only thing that grows the business. Mm -hmm. And so once you can kind of get out of that grind, you move into what I call the manager role because I'm in retail, right? So a lot of these are kind of retail related, retail and e-commerce. So you move into manager role, which means you, you probably have some people working for you, but your job is basically just to keep the things turning over. Like you're still working in your business, in, in retail and e-commerce, like you're still in the store, you're still packing orders, you're still answering emails, all those kinds of things. Just think of what a, a shop manager would do, a store manager, like that's the role you're taking on. So when you move up to the next level, it's what I call the faux EO instead of a CEO, <laughs> because the faux EO, it gets to the point where business is kind of doing okay. Like you can go on a holiday and there it still runs. Like mm -hmm. there are still people to open the doors or pack the orders or keep the business going. You know, the marketing's still going out in some way, shape or form, even if it was pre pre done, but the business is still making money. However, this is the level most people get stuck at. And they, this tends to happen, happen at kind of mid six figures, generally speaking, in my experience, to low seven figures. And this is where the faux EO is controlling rather than being in control. So they micromanage everything. Mm -hmm. Like they're the people who are constantly, you know, was this done? Was this done? Was this done? Was this done? Or that wasn't done the way that I said it. Like they have to have their hands, like their fingers in every single pie. And just because something was done, if it wasn't done the exact same way that they would have done it, it was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens at that level, this is where businesses plateau because when you're at this level and look, I slip back into this all the time. So I'm not saying like, you know, I'm the master at this or anything <laughs> like that. It's so easy to do, especially when you love working because you, you are, you've built, like I've built two businesses now from the ground up from the point of, you know, having to know how the emails work. And I actually, now we've got a new CRM. I have no idea how to send an email. I refuse to learn how to send an email specifically to stop myself from butting in to <laughs> what my team, what, the, what I've delegated my team to do. I haven't written an email for five years, you know, but they all sound oh, like yeah. me. And then once you get, like, if you can get past that, if you can at least recognize that for what it is, it is so much easier to move to, um, you know, what we call in the industry CEO. And it's not what a Fortune 500 would call a CEO, but essentially it's the person who drives the business forward. But if you think about a Fortune 500 CEO, they're not doing the work. They're not sending the emails. They're not out answering sales calls. They're not packing orders. What they're doing is making sure that all the people who are under them are hitting their KPIs, uh, are reporting back, they're on track to be where they need to go, and you're building relationships. That's what they do. Like they, you know, in if, if you look up the definition of CEO, it's going to be something along the lines of taking the board's vision and making sure it gets implemented. So they mm -hmm. they kind of run the ship, but they're not yeah. out there, you know, washing the decks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, which is kind of where we thought we would take this conversation is that isn't everyone's dream. Not no. everyone wants to be the CEO of their own business. And I can already think of five or six really good friends who are in retail who go, but I'm so much better on the floor. That's where I want to be. So I want people to, you know, do this and do this and do that. But, you know, I want to be on the floor. That's where my passion is. And that, you know, is where I want to be. So hire other people to do the other jobs. And I think that's really great. And I think, you know, if you have a passion for your business, you should stay in that passion if that's what you would like to do. 
you know, and you can scale up otherwise. But my one of my first comments to you when we were doing a, a you know, a pre-chat before I press record is some of the circles I hang around and, you know, online and offline, the word scale is a bit of a dirty word. Like They're like, you know, you don't have to scale your business. Not everyone needs to be a six-figure business and seven-figure business, which is 100% correct. But I really feel for the people who would like to scale because they're almost made to feel a bit icky because they do want to scale. They, they want do. More. They want more. They want to be a CEO. You know, they don't want to be doing the doing. So how do you see that? Do you find that scaling is a bit of a dirty word? Because your business hope... is all about scaling, helping people. My scale. program is called Scale Your Store, right? So <laughs> that's the whole thing. There's so much to unpack here. And please feel free to stop me if I waffling, because I feel like you touched on three big things. Um, so the first one is, it is okay to want to have a job, which is the, the people you're talking about, like they work on their shop floor, they just want, basically they want a job. They want a nice secure job where they go in every day. They feel happy. They get to engage with customers. You know, they're doing okay. That's, that is totally okay. What I would say there is because I love making people money, which kind of segues to the next part, which is we have a saying inside of all of our programs, the more money you make, the more people you can help, or the more money you make, the more people you can serve. Mm -hmm. And the way that, in retail, I, I explain it like this. If you make more money, you've probably served more customers to begin mm -hmm. with. Like you, you've sold more things, you've you've helped more people. And every transaction that you have is helping the end person. Like people buy from you for a reason. Yes. They're buying to solve a want or a need. You know, you didn't con them out of their money. So the first part, you know, the double entendre is the more money you make, the more people you can help. So one, you help your customers, but two, you can then take that money and do stuff with it. And so I remember having this conversation with my daughter, who's now 14 and doesn't have a conversation at all, <laughs> but we were walking um, down the hill back home from walking the dogs. And we were talking about, about money. And she was asking the question about whether she should spend her money on something expensive or should she get the cheaper version? And she wanted to buy flowers because there was a florist just at the end of our street. And I was like, well, if you buy flowers from Banjo's mum, that was the lady who ran it. If you buy flowers from Banjo's mum, when you give her that money, she gets to use that money to pay her rent. So she's going to be helping the person who owns the store. Um, she can pay for Banjo to go to kindy. So my daughter's in year nine now. This is how long the conversation was, but it was yeah. one of those, those <laughs> lasting moments. She can pay for Banjo to go to kindy and, um, you know, maybe they might like to go on a holiday so she can take your money and put it towards going on a holiday. And right next door to the florist was a Thai takeaway restaurant. And she went, oh, maybe she could take my money and buy Thai takeaway for the family. <laughs> and so like it's probably one of the big things I've instilled coming from ridiculously poor family is the value of money. Mm -hmm. And so now I'd like to think that I've instilled that in her and we get so that this kind of segues to the next bit, which is scaling a scene as dirty, but why? Like if we make more money, we serve more customers. We can put more money back into the economy. We can buy a nice car if we want to, but that money still goes other places. Mm. Like it, and, and I think we get so, like tall poppied here in Australia yeah. about the fact that we make more money, mm -hmm. but a lot of people who make a lot of money give to charity. Like they, you know, they send their kids to a private school. Sure. But they're still paying teachers, you know, mm -hmm. they're still paying taxes, all those things. So if we can take this stigma away from being okay to make a lot of money, then I think that kind of reverses everything as well. And so I don't wonder if the people who make scaling out to be a bad thing are people who have a problem with other people having money. That's a very deep question. <laughs> and next time I see someone dissing on scaling, I will run that through my little brain and go, hmm, what's that? Say? But so often when we're doing things and hearing things, the person the person saying it, it says more about them, them than the person. 100%. And I think that, that the additional part of that is it ref and we can't affect how other people act and how they, how they think. And so I think if 
you're arguing that someone scaling is bad or icky or whatever. The question is, is it just because you feel inferior because you either don't want that or you're too scared to have that? Like what, like how does it affect you if someone makes more money? How does Mm. it affect you if someone builds their business? Like it it just doesn't. So where do you get the right to say to somebody that they're bad or they're evil because they want to help more customers? Yeah, that's a very, (laughs) very big question, of course, um, and probably one that we can't answer on, um, you know, a short podcast interview, but I'm sure that it will be a conversation we will keep talking about. Um, But as far as scaling goes, I know you've got a few hacks that you've sort of learned along the way of scaling your own businesses, as well as teaching many, many people around scaling. Can you share with us a couple of hacks that you've either learned or you've helped other people discover along their journeys? Sure. I think the first one is the one we just talked about, the different roles. Like that is like even just being aware of them is a Mm -hmm. hack and knowing when you're sliding back into an employee or a manager Mm -hmm. or a faux EO or even just noticing where you're at in that journey and, oh, if I want to move to the next level, I probably need to think a little bit differently or act Mm -hmm. a little bit differently. So that would, I'd say, is my first hack. My second one is one that took a business from $120,000 a year to a million dollars a year in five months, which sounds impossible. Sounds like a very fast headache. It is. And and to be fair, <laughs> businesses imp- can implode when that happens. Yes. Because everyone yeah. tells us to prepare for the worst case scenario, but no one ever tells us to prepare for best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, the business didn't implode, which was great, but it did hit some really huge hurdles when you scale that quickly. But for that business and for all the businesses that I work with, I have this thing called the five pillars of retail success. You can put them into any business. It just says retail because that's the thing that I'm in. Money, sales, customers, marketing, and impact. And at any one time, one of those pillars is the thing that you, you, you and your business are crap at. And here's the thing. So every person, I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on the limb and say every single person that I work with is focusing on the wrong thing. And that is why they're not growing. So for example, they're focusing on posting on social media, not to diss social media, uh, but I've built quite a successful business without doing an awful lot on social media. Um, Posting on social media and spending two or three hours a day when the reality is they just don't have a profit margin or Mm -hmm. they don't have the customers coming in. And if they fixed that thing, like fixing their profit margins and increasing their prices or getting more customers in the door, when they identify which of those pillars is holding them back, that is when all of a sudden a lot of the problems that you thought you had just disappear because Mm -hmm. posting on social media doesn't become an issue when you are only doing it to, because in desperation, you're trying to drive customers or drive sales. But actually if you're making more money, that kind of falls away and you start creating the content that you think your customers want rather than these desperate, oh, this is on sale. Oh, buy this thing, buy this thing, buy this thing. Did I mention you need to buy this thing? <laughs> and so that big, the big, big hack that, I mean, that's the whole foundation of our business. And I didn't know it at the time, but I've kind of solidified it down, which is if you can just focus on the pillar that is the weakest for 90 days, you will see exponential results. Like we had somebody do this um, just this week in our program, second week in our program, just made $11,000. And so it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's a huge amount of money. But but it was for them, perhaps. It was for them. Yeah. And there was no outlay whatsoever. There will be outlay in the future, but here's the thing. I probably one of the few people who guarantee that you will make back whatever you pay me, whether it is a $27 product or a $26,000 product or a hundred thousand dollar product. I will put my money on the table and say, if I can't help you make that money, I will give you your money back. And so for her, two weeks in, she's like more than halfway there to getting the money back. In a 12 month period, she's halfway there. And it's like another person, we just did $75,000 in six weeks. Now, I'll be honest, 50 of that 75,000 was getting rid of a really toxic employee, but the new person that they're going to hire is only 30,000. And so yeah. twenty, there you go, $20,000 saved. 
So she's, mm-hmm. she's nearly paid for her program as well. And that is because I, like I said, I have that ability to see the things that need to be fixed in a business. Like I'm a fixer. That's what I do, which can be really polarizing for your <laughs> friends. <laughs> like I just wanted you to listen, but I, I can fix this for you. <laughs> Here are four things we could implement right now. <laughs> when you start to not get invitations to parties, maybe you should, uh, you know, scale back. <laughs> no, you just need to hang out with the right people who get yeah. really excited about it as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, good point. So, so my second hack is just focus on the thing that you need to, not the thing that is the busy work. It is so easy to put 400 things on your to-do list just so you can cross them off. Yeah, But if those 400 things don't actually need to be done and you're literally doing it so you can justify the amount of time that you're putting in, that is why your business is not scaling. That is why your business is not growing. Uh, And then my third thing would be ridiculously simple. Anyone can do it. It won't cost you a thing. Know what you actually want out of your business. Mm -hmm. Do you know it's very rare, and I don't know about you, but you probably see this as well. It is very rare to be able to ask that question to someone. In fact, I'm going to ask you, Jen, <gasps> what do you want out of your business? What do I want out of my business? What's so your vision for the business? My vision for, well, for my marketing and social media business, my vision is to change the world one small business owner at a time by giving them strategy. How are you going to uh, measure that? Like what's the, what's the, like what, what's how, every small business owner? Well, that's the idea. Why not go big or go home? So how are you going to measure that though? How are you going to know how many small business owners there are and whether you're helping them? Well, I know that I'm helping them because I work with them and I see their problems going away or I see them scaling their businesses uh, Mm -hmm. and concentrating a little bit, like you were saying, concentrating on the bits that need to be concentrated on. Like too many small business owners, you know, from a marketing point of view, don't make marketing a priority in their business. No. So that if they just made pro- marketing a priority and had a little bit of strategy around it rather than posting for posting sake or emailing for email sake or marketing because some crazy lady on a podcast told her they had to, um, you know, life would be a little bit better. As, but what does your life look like? Like, do you know how much revenue you want to make? Do you know how much money you want to take home? Do you know how many hours you want to work? Do you know how many people you want to have working for you? Uh, well, I've got a team of virtual assistants, but I do not want any employees. Yes, Mm -hmm. I do. I do. I'm very, um, very comfortable with my business model at the moment for sure. So 10 years from now, if I was to sit down and say to you, oh my God, Jen, I cannot believe everything that you've achieved. What have you done? What's happened? Well, you'll be making an appointment at the lodge. I'd say. I'll be running the country. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Is that actually, is it, is that in the cards? That, well, I don't know if it's in the cards, but it's on the goal list to go into politics and change the world. Awesome. And so yeah. here's the thing. Most people can't answer that question. Most people can give you half an hour of everything they don't want. Yeah. And they can't give you a distinct answer on what they do want. Mm-hmm. And so my question to you listening, not necessarily you, Jen, would be, <laughs> If you don't know what you want, then how the heck are you ever going to know if you got there? Like, how do you ever get to see success if there is no definition of success? And I am terrible at this. Like, Mm -hmm. I think if you are someone who loves working and if you are like very type A goal oriented action taking, we forget to stop and appreciate success. It's like, okay, that's done next Mm -hmm. and if you can't if you can't verbalize that or if you can't write it down then two things happen one you never feel like you're successful you'll constantly be feeling like you're defeated or you're never there but also as a leader if you're not doing this for your team like people need kpis they need to know what is your measure of success Mm -hmm. i mean this is not me. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like he adapted it for the workplace. So at the bottom is people want to feel safe. They want to know that they've got a secure job and that they're going to get paid. But as you move up the ladder, people want to be challenged. They want autonomy. They want to be able to think and be creative and 
hit obstacles and problem solve. And if you're just expecting people to turn up and do their jobs and you're not challenging them and you're not giving them some kind of way to think outside the box, then you you lose people, you lose great people because Mm -hmm. it becomes just a transactional position that anyone can do. And I think that's where, again, just setting KPIs and giving people something to strive for. I mean, in my in my business, uh, we used to have the, the different stores and they didn't they didn't particularly get anything for hitting targets. Like occasionally we would give vouchers and stuff, but they used to call each other and go, ha, huh, I just got a $2,000 sale beating you because they could see across all the registers. <laughs> and just that friendly competition was, yes. enough, or they would call each other and go, oh, I had a customer who did this. Like, what would you have done? Like, this is what I did. What mm-hmm. would you have done? And And that autonomy of your team and making them feel like they are part of something bigger will win you people for life. Mm. Like I had people who stayed in my business for five, six, seven years in my current business. Um, best employee is now like six years in seven years in, um, funnily enough, she was my competition <laughs> when I had my retail business. <laughs> and then, um, like we, the only people we tend to lose are people who don't like to be managed. And so the yeah. minute you start calling them out and saying, but we had to get this done, like yeah. it's kind of performance managing people out because all mm-hmm. those people do is bring down the rest of the team and yeah. you build resentment and a toxic workplace. So One of the best things that I did in my retail business, which seems so simple, but, you know, was a decision at the time that my business partner and I kind of tinkered on and then just decided, let's give it a go, was staff meetings. We'd never implemented monthly staff meetings where we would talk about the goals and, you know, get their opinions on, you know, what marketing to do and just throw around ideas and go out for dinner. And they... Like I walked away from that meeting going, oh, I'm a really bad person. They are so much smarter than I ever gave them credit for, for running a business. But they should be smarter than you. Like every employee should be smarter than you. Every person on your team should be better at doing their job than you ever were. Mm -hmm. Because your goal, well, if you want to scale, (laughs) assuming you want to scale, your goal should always be to make yourself redundant in that role. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the the we haven't we haven't talked about this. And please pull me back into line if we're talking for too long. But if I can just give a quick overview, if you're going to sell your business, then if you are if it's a job, as what we've called J O B that you and I have been talking about, that some people are completely happy with. On average, you can get one to maybe one point five times your earnings, not your revenue, your earnings. Yep. So as a business owner, however much you took out $100,000, that's all someone is going to pay for your business plus maybe stock. There's no goodwill. There's no anything. But if you have a professionally managed business, and by professionally managed, it means that someone can buy your business and either integrate it into theirs or they don't have to work in your store or they don't have to be the person that runs the entire business. If they can create something out of your business that doesn't require them having to make every single decision then you are looking at anything from three to six times more money. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like that's huge. That's massive, but you can see like, cause not everyone wants to buy themselves a job. No, so no. That and buyer sometimes it might just a... be a competitor. It's like, yes. I, don't, I don't, I don't want you at all. All I want is your location or your yep. people or your customers. And yep. they're not going to pay you three times if you're the person who works behind the counter, or if you're the person who's writing the copy, like there's nothing in it for them. And the only value they're going to place is the bit that they want to pick out. I've done this. I've bought a business for the email list and said, I'll give you five grand for the email list. Yeah. I I don't want anything else. (laughs) The rest of it's crap. (laughs) (laughs) But you have to, like you put so much heart and soul into your business, but the other person doesn't care about that. They only want the bit that they want. And so if you can even just get your business to the point where you don't have to be the entire driving force, yes, you can be the vision and yes, you can do some of the work, but if you can get your business to a point where if we're talking about retail, you have a store manager, you have staff, you have a marketing plan, you have suppliers, you've got a bookkeeper looking after your money, or you've got a virtual CFO looking after your money, 
that becomes instantly more attractive to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so if nothing else, think about scaling in terms of the return you want to get out for the five, 10, 15, 20 years that you put in. Is it just one X? And and I see so many businesses, you know, taking ridiculously small amounts of money because the owner didn't take a big wage. You know, they took 50 grand a year. And now all they're going to get is 50 grand. And they're like, you know, I put 20 years into this to get 50 grand. Like surely it's got to be worth more than that. I was like, actually it's not. Yeah. For all the reasons you just sort of talked about for yeah. sure. Yeah. This has been such a great conversation. So you are just a wealth of knowledge, information, and, uh, you know, highlights for anyone who's listening. But one of the questions I really did want to, um, you know, put in to the conversation is, you know, you talked about how you started a business during the GFC. Now I'm certainly not predicting that there's a GFC or a recession coming. And I think that, you know, the uh, media would like us to to think there's a recession coming, but I think we need to look beyond the scary stories that they keep serving us up. But what does retail look like in 2023? Because my experience over the last couple of years is we've seen a really big peak for online e-commerce because we couldn't go shopping. And now things just like the housing market and every other market is really starting to settle. So, but you know, your knowledge you have around uh, e-commerce and retail. I'd like to get your thoughts on what's this going to look like this year. So I think there is, we can't deny that there is a tightening of belts. Yes. Like people, there are groups of people who are spending less. Mm -hmm. If I have a choice in business, I will always go after the people where discretionary income is not really a factor depending on economic circumstances. And Mm -hmm. so we could call it a luxury brand, but even higher end brands. If you use the words in your branding of things like affordable or value, then you are probably being affected right now because you're trying to go after that mid tier people bracket of spenders. And they are the people who are tightening their belts right now. But at the same time, the client I was just talking to you about is a fashion store in Canada, purely online, just sold $11,000 worth of jeans in two days at $175 a pair. Mm -hmm. So the simple fact is people are still spending money. And I mean, it's February now, but I just did a Christmas tree drive for scouts, you know, 10th of December. We made a ridiculous amount. Christmas tree, a real Christmas tree. Is that a luxury (laughs) item? Kind of, sort of, right? Like you could buy a dollars one from Kmart or you could buy the $150 live one that's only going to last for four weeks and the Christmas pudding because, of course, we put cross cells in and the Christmas cake and what else did we say? Oh, and donations. And so the the simple fact is people will always have money to spend. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself why they are or why they aren't spending with you. Now, some Mm -hmm. of it might be, like you said, marketing. Like you and I both know that people are in Facebook groups every single day going, my sales have dropped off can you tell me what's wrong with my website? And you're, we both, the first question we ask is, so what marketing are you doing? And they say, <laughs> posting on social media. All right. So four people saw you yesterday. <laughs> like That is not marketing guys. <laughs> and so there's two, I think two things there is one, you have to know your customer. And if you are going to go after the, the customer that everybody else is going after that, you know, that mid tier customer who is really feeling the crunch because interest rates have gone up nine times, then yeah, you are going to be effective. But if you are also not doing any marketing, then now more than ever, customers in that mid-tier bracket are much more savvy Mm. and can do a lot more research. So if you're not using things like Google shopping, you're a freaking idiot um, because we don't have time. Like I had to go, I'm going on a yacht on Friday for a business thing. And oh, I'm like, darn. I know, so hard. <laughs> but I'm like, I wear wrap dresses and they are not yacht worthy because a bit of wind and whoop. And I was like, okay, so I need to buy a new dress that is like a, in my head, I knew I needed a halter neck because I like the halter neck style. And I wanted a maxi dress, but not a fufu one. I kind of wanted one that was still quite slim fitting. So that if the wind got up, it didn't go whoop. So what did I do? I Google shopped halter neck maxi dress 
Now, if you sell halter net maxi dresses and you weren't on Google Shopping, I did not come to your store mm -hmm. because I just sat there and I just browsed through Google Shopping. And then I was like, pink, yellow, green, blue to kind of narrow it down. <laughs> and then I bought one and because they had Google Shopping. So a couple, you know, so what we said was one, knowing who your customer is, two, making sure you're marketing, but three, also being where people are looking because mm -hmm. If you are selling stuff, people are looking like, that's the first place we're going to go. Google shopping. Yes. Yeah. We still go into stores. I'm not going to deny the fact that, you know, had I been able to get that dress in a store, I would have gone there, mm -hmm. but they didn't have it within a 30 kilometer radius. Luckily it turned up in time and it looks great. <laughs> um, but people will always want stuff now. So yes, the discretionary spending is going to be reduced in certain brackets. But at the same time, people are dropping money. Like there's no, like we, we have a holiday house and people were spending $7,000 to spend a week there at Christmas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's people still have money. Yes. Not everybody is affected to that level. So don't take your own necessarily financial situation or your own money beliefs and put them onto your customers because no one died and made you the value God. Because what some people value, in my case, going to Google shopping, maybe spending a bit more, but knowing I can buy a dress in 30 minutes or less may not be what you value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, so many good points there. And I, yeah, I remember, was in a Facebook group um, just, last week, I think it was, and they were talking about, you know, my sales have gone down and this and that. And this one lady said, oh, look, I've had really great sales over the last two years and I've barely marketed. It's like, wow. How much money did you lose? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how good are you? Guess what? <laughs> You're going to have to do some marketing now. Because... Oh, guess what? You probably could have done double the revenue and had some extra cash in the bank to get you through this if you would have done some marketing. Fancy that, swallowed the Fancy cat. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, I, like, I know you love social media and you're way better at it than I probably will ever be, but it can't be the be all and end all. No. No. It has to just be part of the plan. And if you are not tracking the results that you're getting, if you aren't using UTM tags, if you are not looking at in, you know, in our case, your Shopify store to see how much traffic and sales are being driven. If you're not recording any of that, then you're just doing it for what I like to call brand awareness in air quotes. And you probably can't afford a brand awareness campaign. Yeah. Like, you know, stop just writing stuff off of as brand as aware awareness because you won't put your CEO hat on. You won't step up. You won't be responsible for making sure that you get a return on investment. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Goodness me. Okay. So they were really great points for going into 2023 and really they're just good, great. They're just good points for being I think they're good points for a any savvy time in business. business owner. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing. And I think that is part of the problem and also the joy of the problem is there is no silver bullet. There is no one thing that we can tell you as retail experts or marketing experts or sales experts that are going to help you. You just need to know the basics. And, and you need to be tracking. Work. Like and, we, yeah. we have, we have what we call the CEO dashboard inside of our programs. And it's actually mandatory for everyone to fill it out as part of their money back guarantee. Because if you aren't tracking, so there's a thing called Pearson's law and Pearson's law is paraphrased. What's measured improves and mm -hmm. what's measured and reported improves exponentially. And this is why accountability and coaching and all that stuff works. Because if someone is calling you out and making you report back, you can bet your bottom dollar that you will put the extra work in. But if you are not measuring and you are not tracking, kind of comes back to the, well, how the heck do you know if you're actually doing any good? Like you get to the end of the quarter and you feel your buzz out and you're like, oh, I got less money than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not, funny. Now. that's not funny at all. But yes, yes. Um, I got, I have myself an accountability uh, buddy coach this year and I've had getting YouTube, like repurposing content in YouTube on my list for, I'm not even going to tell you how long. And we had an accountability call last Friday. I was done if I was turning up without yeah. that stuff done. <laughs> 
<laughs> I was like, all right, there is no way I can hop on this Zoom and say, oh, I didn't get it done. It's just like, right, quit. We, we, Let's we, do have, it. For, we have an accountability coach inside of our programs and you get seven minutes to answer five questions. And that's it. That, there's, it's nothing else other than, you know, where you're at. What did you say you were going to do? Did you do it? Did you get any, obs like, were there any obstacles we need to help you with? And what are you going to do in the next two weeks? Yeah. And guess what? People get stuff done. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. So this has been so good. Thank you so much for your time. This was well worth waiting for, although I did have to wait a little bit longer than I would have liked to have had you on my podcast, but that is entirely my fault for not reaching out a lot earlier, but I've That's been- That's all good following as a super fan for a very long time. If someone would like to get in touch with you and hear a little bit more about yourself or your programs or follow along, where's the best place for them to get in contact with you? So if you want to hear more about what I have to say, because clearly I like to speak, I have a <laughs> podcast called Bringing Business to Retail, where we cover retail and e-commerce growth strategies. Uh, you can follow me on social media if you like, the Selena Knight, but you know, I'm working on it. Uh, but just send me a DM. Like I talk, I'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> sounds great sounds great i will have uh the link to your podcast in the show notes as well as your website and things like that so thank you so much again for coming on and sharing your wisdom today thank you for having me it's been fabulous pleasure thanks see ya